Welcome to this week's episode of Rider Support. Today we're going to talk about the decathlon bike sold out almost instantly, how to treat a saddle sore, when you should ditch your indoor cycling, but first, five things the pro riders are doing that you most probably aren't. Sarah. Anthony. Your smiling face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Gotta, gotta keep it smiling anyway. I'm hiding a wall of fatigue behind my smile today. <laughs> you did a, what, a six hour, six hour ride Six today? hours too many. Six hours too many. We want to talk about what the pros are doing that amateurs aren't, but that comes from a question from listeners, I think. Yeah, this question came in from Colm and he says, Hi, Anthony, I'm trying to upgrade myself as a cyclist this summer. I spend a lot of time cycling and training and I'm a total addict, but feel like I can up my game a bit to level up. Any insights as to a few things that the pros do that set them apart? Things like weeks at altitude and advice like that isn't what I'm after here. I'm looking for a few things that us normal cyclists can do. I think there's a few things. Yeah, definitely like the weeks at altitude, the 40-hour training weeks. You know, no one's doing a 40-hour training week, but you know what I mean? Like that's again, not very replicatable for your typical amateur. But I think there is some good stuff. Uh, you won't know who this is because you're not a huge basketball fan, but there was the head coach of UCLA called John Wooden. And I think I was telling you about this story the other day. He went in and he took over this team and they were already a very successful team. And he went into the dressing room and the first thing he... he done was hold up a sock and he's like okay everyone listen this is how you put on a sock and he rolled through and said okay so you fit it snugly around the toes you iron out the creases we do this because i don't want anyone getting blisters and he's like this is how you put on a sneaker and he unlaced them laced them all the way up and he's like and you double knot it because i don't want anyone's laces coming undone and the idea was how you do anything is how you do everything that's something that the pros do they have consummate attention to detail. They won't go out training with a dirty bike. They won't go out training with dirty shoes because how they do anything is how they do everything. I think that's one really important thing that the pros do. I spoke with the head of performance for Bora, Dan Lorang, a few weeks ago. And kind of a second point to build on that, he said there's such a difference between the neo pros or people just coming into the team and Primoz Roglic. He said, when you sign a rider like Primoz Roglic, obviously you get a marquee rider, all the marketing that goes with that, the race wins. But he's like, the habit formation that he has, the, like the impact of habit formation on younger lads. He said, you go into Roglic's room, everything is immaculately folded, not just his cycling kit, the entire room. It, there's calmness so because the peloton is chaos so he's created this sanctuary of calmness his kit is perfectly folded everything's clean he's like the room smells good he's like you went to somebody younger in the Oprah's room it's like flush the toilet it's disgusting <laughs> in here it doesn't Boys seem like disgusting. that stuff makes a difference but it really does make a difference uh, you're pushing me now for five a third one I think pro I had a director and he used to say to me there's a word before cycling that's pro pro cycling pros show up all the time and I know that sounds obvious but everyone listening is probably a pro in something they're a pro carpenter they're a pro so if you think about what are the attributes of a pro well like you show up when you don't feel that good you show up if you're having a bad day you show up if you had a fight with the missus you show up if you know anything you show up that's what you do because you're a professional we don't really approach your training like that we approach your training as an amateur we approach your training we train when we feel like it pros know that motivation follows action. They don't wait for motivation to strike. They do the thing and then they'll feel motivated after. That's, I think, maybe the most important one. And for a final one, I think pros have a very long-term horizon. They don't look at one race, get dropped and think, oh, I'm shit at cycling. I got dropped today. Packing it in. Yeah. They just zoom out and go, no, I had a bad day. I'm in this for the next decade. How do I improve? How do I take that failure as feedback and improve my training based on that? Yeah, that's really good. I think for me, how somebody can level up, let's say you've take somebody who comes to our group ride who has won a couple of, gotten promoted. They have won a couple of their category races. They've got their bike clean. They've got their kit is absolutely immaculate. And they've got a really, really kind of like a, next level mindset. I think that the next thing that you can do as a cyclist is to start paying it back. So the young person that comes in yeah. or the 
female rider who's nervous or the newbie, take them under your wing and be like, okay, this is how you do this and show them the kind of little beautiful nuances. That Why do you think that is? Because you learn more by teaching? Well, you learn, I, do, I just think it's about paying it forward and that will also give you this crazy respect from other cyclists who might be a couple of steps behind you or even a couple of steps ahead of you that they're looking at you and they're like, oh wow, this person is really, you know, paying it forward, doling out their knowledge, passing it on and they want everyone to succeed in this sport. They're not gatekeeping. And I think that that's what will kind of set you apart as like to level you up as a cyclist. I remember reading, I think everyone goes through this journey. I remember reading one of Tony Robbins's self-help books. I'm a self-help junkie. You if are. Anyone <laughs> know, all, all my books are self-help. They are. Uh, reading one of Tony Robbins's books and he's feeding like a crazy amount of people in the US every year. I can't remember what the program was called. We call it Feed Like America. a million meals. Yeah, something. something like that. Yeah. It's nuts. Yeah. Well, this is based on the philosophy of the more you give, the more you get. And he gives away like a very large percentage of his annual income each year in the kind of, in deference almost to this principle of reciprocity. You know, the way Harry Krishna come up to you and annoy you when you're walking around town to give you a flower. Well, that's also based on reciprocity. They think if they give you a flower, you're more likely to give back to them, whether that's monetarily or with your time or whatever. And it's kind of the same thing. So I wonder, does that translate into the cycling world where when you give back to the cycling community, you're almost rewarded by the cycling gods and you get something extra back? Karma. I agree. I think doing good deeds is, I mean, it's never a really bad thing, but that to me is how you really show your absolute class on the bike. I remember when I first started cycling, obviously I had Anthony kind of on my side and constantly, you know, giving me tips here and there. And one of the other riders one day, Sean McKenna came out and he's absolutely pure class. One of the best riders. No, he is. (laughs) (laughs) One of the best riders of the generation. And he was just like, you know, giving me like the odd tip. But first he told me to get out of my big ring. I wasn't... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you didn't know what a big ring was. And it was just like listening to somebody who was clearly much, much better. I mean, pulls apart and it really helped me, really helped my confidence. And yeah, it's just absolute class. Okay, now you've paid your homage to Sean. Question number two. <laughs> Question number two. Anthony, I got to ask, with less than five miles to go to get the century, why stop? I understand that for some people, that just doesn't mean much. But for others... And me, my OCD and sense of accomplishment would need to complete that. I've only done one 100 mile ride. For those that do it often, or maybe it's part of training, I get that it's maybe not that big of a deal. Cheers from the flat Midwest States. And this was prompted by somebody who follows you on Strava and they saw your ride actually from today. And they were like, he was five miles away from reaching the 100 mile mark. Now for us over here in New money that's 160.93 kilometers it doesn't it has never bothered you I've been on rides with you where it's like we've been at like 59.89 kilometers and I'm like come on let's just you know try and get to 60 and you're like why (laughs) I titled a ride like a couple of years ago I don't know 199.8 kilometers and I titled it because when you're done you're done (laughs) and people (laughs) freaked out going would you not just ride around the car park and get an extra 200 meters okay so first than this one because it's a mile kilometer translation that never even dawned on me yeah like, you had you had 150 you probably had 150 kilometers on your clock yeah i was just going out for a five-hour ride and i yeah. came in and that's where it was i also just i just don't think that matters i just don't think that matters at all it's like what am i going to be going better because i got an extra two mile in like i'm also like i'm not riding enough that a five-hour ride is nothing to me like i'm still pretty fatigued at the end of a five-hour ride so I'm just like not in the mood to rise. Yeah, an extra 15, 20 minutes. For what? Yeah, to get a number. I have to say, I don't think I'm really into that either. I don't know. I've obviously, I've done a couple of centuries just on big sportive days by accident because I had to get to the finish line. But I don't think it's something that I really obsess about either. I think if that's the way that your mind works and you kind of think, okay, I've done three centuries before. I'd love to do two this year. And you'd like to have that on Strava. And it's like an important number for you more power to you but yeah not something that I would yeah maybe it's a milestone for some people that haven't ridden very much and yeah I can see if he hasn't ridden very much that uh, like I couldn't tell you how many hundred mile rides I've done a thousand more like uh, so yeah if you haven't ridden very much maybe it is that kind of 
badge of honour or acceptance into a club that you've graduated to the next level of being able to... Because there's a lot goes into doing a 100 mile ride. You need fitness, you need to carve out the time in the day, you need to get your kit right, you need to get your hydration, your fueling right. So it is an accomplishment that people should be proud of and it, he shouldn't feel less about his accomplishment because it's you know a little bit insignificant for me. It's still pretty cool to ride 100 it miles, is. so fair play in the Midwest. Absolutely. Okay, next question. Dear Anthony, dear Anthony. <laughs> From my ma. <laughs> I've been a regular road cyclist for the last 33 years and thoroughly enjoyed it with group rides, races, and now mainly solo rides. But one thing that strikes me now is the huge increase in traffic on the road and even the quieter country lanes that I've always trained on have become busier. I believe by about 35%. And this takes away some of the pleasure that I get. The other issue I've noticed when I'm cycling is the fact that cars have become so much bigger and wider and people pass you much closer than they ever did, freaking you out. Our country lanes are not wider, so why have cars been built so wide? The worst ones are the ones where they have a wide axle body area, but a smaller passenger area, deceiving the driver of the actual width of the car. Can you possibly tell me why this has happened. And that's from Stephen. Stephen, thank you for that. No. I mean, I, <laughs> I think first of all, the point that I would make about the wider cars, I mean, car companies and manufacturers don't care about us. And there is an appetite for bigger cars. And it's mostly as a status symbol for people. Well, like I can't speak to engineering or status symbols. That's just like not my area. I don't know why the cars have got bigger. They have. I think that's the reality we're dealing with. We were kind of debating this, actually myself and a friend during the week. There's two slightly different problems. Close passes are a problem. And that's what he's talking about here with the wider cars. And they're definitely a big, big problem. More close passes than ever. I feel it every single day of the week. It's You feel the car behind you. It's uncomfortable. You're anticipating the close pass. It ruins your ride. Close passes, when I get killed out training, which is a chance of that that's greater than zero, or when oh someone listening has a bad accident out training, I don't think it's going to be a close pass that gets them. I think statistically, and I don't have anything to back this up, just anecdotally, it's distracted drivers. Close passes are a problem, but they're not the problem. Distracted drivers is what's killing people. That's people on their phone. That's people, you know, playing Apple CarPlay, which is basically a laptop on your screen. Yeah. And I think they're two distinct issues. I think a close pass is a driver who is maybe just a fringe case where they look up the last minute and they kind of swerve around you and that's, you know, gives the close pass. But I think close pass is quite a, I'm paying attention, it's conscious, I either don't care about you or I've misjudged the room. That's use case A. The distracted drivers is more happening on isolated country roads. Someone isn't anticipating a cyclist and that's where we're seeing more of the deaths. Okay. Uh, that's what I think, anecdotally. And I just think they're, they're very different and we've conflated these two issues as being the same. I would like to see more advocacy going on distracted drivers than close passes. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think I, I've never really looked at close passes, to be honest, at, as something that somebody does on purpose. And maybe that's me being a little bit naive. It They do make me extremely angry and they're absolutely terrifying. I don't know if I meant on purpose. I know I said on purpose, but I, I yeah. think I just meant more consciously it's not like they're on their phone and they're just yeah, zooming past but they you. are driving by and they're focusing on driving yeah, they just don't care and about they don't care. they're oblivious they're oblivious yeah that's how I think and that's what makes me really angry is that as you said they don't care about you and not paying attention properly for my life Stephen I'm sorry I don't think we have really any you know insights there except to say that we do get questions like this in every single week and people are really baffled and kind of confused as to what's happening out there in the roads and it seems to be really happening all over the world so I think Anthony you're right like as the more that we can do to lobby and advocate and get our cycling boards and our governments to pass new laws maybe stricter penalties for people who are driving on their phones driving distracted other than that, I don't really know what we can do in the very, well, very short term. The Cycling Club, which is a cycling club here in Ireland, yeah. they sent an open letter into Cycling Ireland, which is the governing body of cycling here in Ireland. I think that's a great idea. It if you're really in a cycling powerful. club, yeah. 
you know, and you have some ability to influence the cycling club decisions, send an open letter into your governing body and say, put a sh- push it back on them and say, we pay a license fee with you. We need you to advocate on our behalf. The roads are not safe for riding a bike. We need help. Yep, I totally, totally agree. That's the way I would approach it too. Okay, next question. Anthony and Sarah, a quick thank you to you guys for a question you covered a few weeks ago in an episode about an affordable but high spec bike. And you guys suggested the Van Riesel by Decathlon. I managed to get one on pre-order. I couldn't believe my luck, Tim. Congratulations, Tim, because they are like gold dust. They sold out within, so they went up on sale on the UK website at I think 10 a.m. and the pre-order was sold out by noon. So that will tell you the demand for this bike is absolutely crazy. Well, I looked on the Irish website that evening and they were also, there was an extra large in like a SRAM Apex or a SRAM whatever, the one down, the SRAM Ultegra equivalent, whatever that is. Uh, There was one in extra large size and everything else was sold out. That was it. Like Van Riesel have done a really good job. They've started making a dent in the high-performance cycling market. I I think that Van Riesel is a protest from consumers saying, no, no. 15 grand bikes? No, we're done. Hey, Roadman, excuse the short interruption. I love riding the bike, but on account of being so busy with the podcast at the moment, I'm now what's called a time-crunched rider. I never thought I'd see the day. But I have a tool. I'm using what bike to keep myself sharp and on point with specific sessions to maximize that available training time. I have a what bike Adam right here in the recording studio beside me. And when I have an hour in between interviews, I jump on. It's removing all the friction points for me. There's no more 10 minute setup, unfolding legs, banging my knees off stuff, getting my hands dirty, the usual connection issues. It just works every single time. The Atom's perfect for virtual racing as well because it has crisp gear changes, it has 1% accuracy, and it has max gradient capability of up to 25%. If you're looking for an indoor trainer, I honestly couldn't recommend this any higher. I've been using a Watt bike since 2013. Honestly, it's the last indoor trainer that you're ever going to need. If you head on over to whatbike.com now and use code ROADMAN10, that's R O A D M E N. T-E-N, and that's going to get you 10% off your watt bike. Yeah, I totally agree with you. So basically, Decathlon, they came out a couple of years ago when they, you know, when they launched this idea or were about to bring it to the market and basically said that they want to be in the next, by 2026, in the top five global bike brands, which is like a really, you know, that's like a very, that's very... That's like Aldi saying that. That's like Aldi saying it. And then when they went in and when the when AG2OR started riding the decathlon bikes, I think everyone was just a bit like, oh my God, this is completely against the status quo of these insanely priced high-end bikes. Bikes. They've done something really, really kind of cute, I think, as well. And they've called it basically an absolute replica of the bikes that they're using on the team. And so they've kitted the ones that have gone to market out exactly the same. The only difference is apparently that the ones that you will buy from the store or online are slightly heavier. And I think that that's been a really interesting marketing tactic that you can ride the exact bike and the bike the Decathlon bike has actually already tasted victory in nine races. So, do, I mean, is there any more kind of marketing, you know, kudos for a bike? So I'm not surprised that it's sold out. £9,000 or €9,000. Well, you can you. ride the bike the quick step years. It, yeah. it's maybe just they've drawn attention to it. I think it. it's just that they've drawn the attention to it. I think it's just been a very interesting kind of marketing, f- especially for people who don't really know about... Yeah, because every bike brand's top of the line is the one that's used, that's like right. Israel Premier Tech's yeah, but bike I, is as the a newbie fa- coming in, new factor. I'm like, okay, is that DI2 or what's SRAM? What's, you know, what's uh, Shimano? What's this? Yeah. Whereas like they have literally put this in black and white. This is a replica of what they're riding in the AG2R team. I yeah, because you it. actually don't know when you get started with like we think that everyone knows what it means to have a Jura Ace with DI2 yeah. when that's very exclusionary vocabulary and no one can make I get a lot of questions from people getting into the sport saying like can you translate this for me like yeah. bar wit you know setback on C posts like people don't understand this even crank lengths this is stuff that 
you know, I've just my whole life understood what I are. still don't know what a bottom bracket is. I still don't know what a tracker mortgage is. <laughs> Oh, don't tell anyone I admitted to that. But yeah, look, I think it's absolutely brilliant. They're kind of turning the whole bike industry around and 9K is still a pretty it's penny a for a money. bike. <laughs> okay, next question. Hi, Anthony and Sarah. It's a delicate topic, but I seem to have recurring saddle sore that just won't go. Well, it will go, but then it will come back a couple of weeks later. I'm genuinely about to sell my bike over this. Any advice before I pack in a cycling? all together and that's from Adam. Don't show it to your girlfriend <laughs> or she'll pack in the relationship. Adam, I I I have been known to suffer from saddle sores before and they are extremely painful. Um, you know, I've always had to go and get an antibiotic. I've, you know, they they can be absolutely crippling. They'll definitely have you off the bike. And there's a million reasons why you could potentially be getting a saddle sore. For me, it's when I'm not training at all. And then I go and I start doing like, you know, a 12 or a 15 hour week straight away and my body just says no, or if I'm a bit run down. So I'm sure you've looked into a lot of these. Ciccone, you know, um, the, tra- the little track rider, he's just back from a saddle sore. He yeah. had to have an operation. He was out for about six weeks. So even the pros who were absolutely looking after themselves really well, he would think have their bike fit completely dialed in, perfect saddle for themselves. You know, it can happen to those people as well. Well, it could be so many different things contribute to it. And I suppose that leads into how you treat it. I think... Keeping it dry and clean is really essential. And that's how you can get them if you have the start of it and then you have a really mucky, horrible day where it's, you know, you're on the bike for six, seven hours and it's wet and dirt is getting into it. That's how a small little saddle sore can actually flare up and it can be a big one. But a really helpful tip for that is get out of your kit as soon as you come in. Straight away. Like as soon as you come in the door, have your recovery drink in the shower if you can or while you're transitioning to the shower like get out of that kit you don't want to be sitting around in those shorts chamois cream as well I know not everyone uses chamois cream I actually don't use it that often but it does prevent that friction Mm -hmm. which will stop you occasionally getting saddle sores and bad shorts Mm -hmm. I I almost think they're a trade-off if you have really good shorts I don't find you need to use chamois cream that much the worse the shorts are the more I feel a need to use chamois chamois cream cream. but I think both of those and you you touched on bike fit and your saddle as well they're both very good suggestions and what I also will say is hygiene and I've spoken about on the podcast before I have actually and I will link the episode in the show notes I've done a complete podcast on saddle sores and how to treat them and how to avoid them that's probably going back six months but I will put that in but I did a poll on Twitter about a year ago about you know how often do you wash your cycling kit and I have to say I was shocked horrified and completely revolted at the amount of people who don't wash their chamois shorts after every use yeah I can't believe people reuse it's shocking I would not go trying to rather than wear a dirty chamois same I just can't believe it. I mean, I can and I can't. I have, I mean, I'm in the gym sometimes I can smell guys, it's usually men, that like haven't washed their kit, their their gym stuff probably since they used it the last time. It is usually guys. The back of my gym, bottom of my gym bag doesn't smell great now. Oh, Jesus Christ, gross. But um, yeah, go and check out that full podcast. And I did have a little look online about this as well. And somebody suggested buying in the meantime, until you get this figured out is buying a recumbent bike which is <laughs> which is an option that will definitely take the pressure off if please don't these do keep that. going if these keep coming please go and seek some medical advice from your doctor I used to get them quite bad when I was in the States and Canada for quite a while and I found a cream called Bactroban I think it's prescription but it's like a antibacterial cream and that worked really well for me the last one you could like apply like a warm compress onto it yeah. and that's going to help get circulation and stuff back to the area yeah. as well Adam's in good company I mean we do know that Sean Kelly was on he was on the way to I think winning his second Vuelta in a row in 87 I'm going to guess I don't have this written <laughs> on my notes I should and he had to pull out because he had a well he called it a boil which <laughs> That sounds the, worse than a saddle sore. The sword. visual of a boil. That's how you get down the country. The tougher lads get yeah, boils. Yeah, that's what, that's what the lads in Carrick get. They don't get saddle sores. They're nothing as delicate as that. They get a boil. <laughs> okay. A boil gives you a visual it of it does. as well, doesn't it? It's like if you pop the boil with a needle, it just... Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, next question. Hey, Ronwen, now that the bright evenings are back, I'm tempted to ditch the indoor trainer and do all my sessions outside. Someone once told me that you get more out of an outdoor session and more adaptations, but that sounds backwards to me. Anthony, what do you advise? Hey Roadman, today's episode is brought to you by our amazing clothing sponsor, Lacal. I bounced around cycling clothing brands for the better part of a decade until I found Lacal. And then I settled. The moment I put that kit on, I knew I was stuck. Founded by former Team GB cyclist Yanto Barker, Lacal isn't just another cycling brand. It's an apparel brand born out of professional cycling's heart and soul. I had Yanto on the podcast and his mission it shone bright in that conversation for me. He wants to create the ultimate cycling gear and he's doing this by combining pro-level insights with the kind of technical details that make all the difference. So whether you're racing, you're training, or you're just enjoying the ride, it's an amazing piece of kit. Every piece of Lacal kit, it's tested to the limit, ensuring it stands up to the toughest rides. What really sets Lacal apart for me is how they've taken the feedback from the World Tour teams they've sponsored, working with top aerodynamicists, and they've incorporated that into all their kit. So whether you're pushing to beat your own personal best or you're just out enjoying the open road, Lacal's mission is help you get the most out of every single ride. Trust me, feeling good on the bike means performing well. And with Lacal, you're always in good hands. We've teamed up with Lacal to give you an amazing discount. If you head on over to lacal.cc and use the code ROADMAN20 at checkout, you're going to get 20% off your Lacal order. I suppose it depends what you mean by adaptations. Are you looking for physiological adaptations or bike handling adaptations? I think they're two different and you could separate them. Also, mental health benefit of riding outside. Physiologically, straight up, you're better off just jumping on a walk bike and yeah. doing your 60, 90 minutes inside. The quality of the session you'll get, it's going to be way higher. It's structured. There's no red lights. There's no downhills. There's no tailwinds. Free there's no freewheeling. Yeah. So, I don't know, 60 minutes is probably worth 80, 90 minutes outside especially for me like the traffic is shocking around here at the moment yeah. you're stopped freewheeling more than you're riding half the time but I don't think you can be one of these whiffed warriors that's just doing all their riding inside because ultimately you're going to need to know how to handle your bike in a crosswind how to corner when you feel a front wheel slipping on a gravel corner uh, you know what happens if you miss an apex these are skills that are real world skills and you can't learn them like remotely watching YouTube videos on Moharich Descend and the Poggio. Like you need to practice <laughs> this stuff. Don't do that at home, folks. No, don't, <laughs> don't super talk with a dropper post. I think we saw this, didn't we, after COVID where a lot of people took up cycling and indoor training and Zwift riding and my bush riding. And when the roads opened again, particularly in Ireland, they were very, very strict and so far we couldn't really train outside that much. And when the roads opened, everyone's out cycling again. I think A&E admissions by cyclists went up by about 80% because people were so strong. They had those big engines, the big endurance engines. They were able to go really fast, but absolutely nothing in the line of bike handling skills. And they, so, they categorised all their crashes called, I was just riding along. I was just riding along. I was just along. riding along and I don't know what happened. <laughs> Did that ever happen to you, Anthony? No, you were just riding along. I actually had one when I got started. I, I had an indoor trainer, but indoor trainer was really bad. This would have been 2007, 2008. It was me and a friend of mine. We didn't know anything about training zones. So we used to just go to the local hill he worked on a building site. I was in college. So from say six o'clock until set, until probably nine or 10 o'clock in the evening. We do three, four hours every night on the local hill. We just literally raced each other up for four hours. Didn't know anything about fuel and didn't know anything about pace and just knock bits out of each other. I mean, limp home, half of each other all the way home <laughs> and then limp home. But on the descent one night, it was pouring rain and really bad lights. And I thought it was a puddle and it was actually a pothole and I hit it and I went straight over the bars. It was one of my few training related crashes. So I haven't had that many touch wood training crashes. Yeah, and plenty the, of race crashes. What's the turn of phrase? It just happened, it came out of nowhere. I don't know. What's your turn of phrase? No, but no. I was oh, just riding along. Oh, you were just riding, just riding along. along. Just riding yeah, along. yeah, because I do kind of roll my eyes a little bit when I hear about people crashing. I'm like, oh my God, what happened? They're just like, just riding along. I'm like, no, I think you need to, I think you need to have a little bit of a hard think about what you did wrong or what you could have done better there rather Extreme than just... ownership. Yeah, sniper got him. Jocko Willock. Sniper's <laughs> taken out many a good man. <laughs> 
<laughs> Folks, thank you for tuning in to another edition of Rider Support. Please keep your questions coming in for Rider Support to either myself or Sarah over on X. We're going to link both those profiles down below. We want this to be a two-way dialogue, so please send in anything you're struggling with. There's another video up here, which I think you're really going to enjoy. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast because it helps the channel more than you know.